Hello, foodie fans. Welcome to the Big Food Talk, produced by Tough Monkey Entertainment. I'm your host, Sal Conca. This show supports restaurants, chefs, and food pioneers with your help. Head to BigFoodTalk.com to make your donation today or check out our fun apparel line with proceeds going directly to participating restaurants. Special thanks to the Long Island Food Council, Dine LI Facebook group, and Yelp Long Island for supporting this episode. Today I'm speaking with Chris, the owner and pitmaster at Big Belly Barbecue in Smithtown, New York. After running a catering business for six years, Chris decided to take the leap and open a restaurant, only to have COVID put the brakes on their plans. Find out how they're helping frontline workers and more about their unique menu items like vegan pulled pork and their meat tornado. Let's hear Chris's story. Welcome to the Big Food Talk. I'm so glad to have you here today. Shout out to Kathy who introduced us, my old friend from high school. I just want to know, how are you guys doing at Big Belly Barbecue? What's going on these days? Hey, so thanks for having us on, brother. I really appreciate it. Um, things are actually a lot better than originally expected. Um, so we purchased this restaurant after having a catering company for six years. Um, around December and January, you know, when this coronavirus stuff kind of, you know, everyone's like, yeah, it's happening in China again, you know, didn't think anything of it. So we got in the building and probably around like late February, early March, we were like ready to go pretty much. We cleaned up the whole place and got it going. And like that, as we all know, it yep. just, it, it went nuts. So we, uh, we decided to hold off our opening for a little bit um, and we donated to hospitals. That was our biggest thing is that we wanted, we had this brand new kitchen. We're like, all right, if we open up right now, you know, it, it just, it didn't feel right. So we decided to donate to all these hospitals. We decided to fundraise and get all this money to be able to help all these people out. And it was a win-win situation. We got just great exposure from it. It helped out at, at this point, I'm thinking around close to 2000 meals. Wow. Cause we still had people donating to it. Um, what do you call it? And we got to like, you know, use our equipment. You know what I mean? Like whenever you get a, a brand new spot, we swapped out everything that was in this place, regardless of the original deal we had, we got to learn all of our equipment, which was the biggest thing. So it was this massive win-win thing. And it allowed us to really kind of get into it a little bit. So that's cool. I, I, you keep saying us a lot. I know you have two partners, but yes. let's go back. And so the restaurant piece of this came later. You said you had a catering business for six years before oh, yeah. that. So how did that all start? How did you guys get together? Where does the passion for barbecue come in? How did you guys learn how to do barbecue the right way? Take me down the path. So basically it started six years ago at Stony Brook University where I had one, one partner that I originally had left a couple of years ago after his father passed away. He was just going through hell and just he needed to leave. It was just the right decision for him. Mm -hmm. So he came to me and my other partner, Matt, and was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And I had a background in digital marketing and I, that I recently just stopped for 10 years, like digital marketing and website design. So me, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'm like, why not? I'm like, let's make a website. Let's see if this thing actually has legs. Let's jump into it, you know? And I loved food always. My, my dad was a chef for 15 years. Like I just ingrained in my head, like it's just I, something I always loved. But my father, hated barbecue. I loved it. My dad was like, I like being in the kitchen. I like sauteing. He's like, that's my thing. You stand out in the heat and you suffer with that. <laughs> so once we got the ball rolling with everything, I kind of got like obsessed with it. I would watch YouTube videos nonstop. I would spend hundreds of dollars on meat every single week. And this is after the last thousand dollars I had to my name that I invested in this company. Literally, I had no other freaking money left. <laughs> And I'm like, let's do this. For people that don't realize, barbecue is a very expensive hobby until it mm -hmm. becomes a business, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, it's even an expensive business. I mean, damn, like a brisket. Brisket alone is a huge chunk of meat and costs a ton of money. Yeah. So once we got the ball rolling with this, it really took around like two, three years. 
Um, but I got, I really personally like, and my partners will tell you this too. I don't want to be that guy. It's like kind of keep them out of the limelight, but I was the one that got obsessed with the barbecue side and the cooking Matt, um, who still has 10% of the company right now. He was one of the original founders of it. Um, he was more of the business side. And then I started learning that over time, but basically I wanted ribs to come out perfect every time. I wanted brisket to come out perfect every time. Pull pork, you know, like it's what I love to do. And to this day, that is my favorite part about this entire business. Like I love getting there at five o'clock in the morning after my partner puts everything in at midnight. And I love doing my thing and bringing that thing to life. Cause after 12, 14 hours, when you have this beautiful piece of meat, like it's like you made this not everyone can do that there's so many errors that come with it and it's just it's thousands of dollars to get this crap right <laughs> absolutely i mean you know there's that there's the guy uh famous barbecue pit master is doing a master class now and he talks about like you know the first brisket he made 16 years ago was a disaster aaron frank yeah yeah so I, I forgot his name yeah but that, yes aaron frank and um you know so that i'm curious you know around you got obsessed with YouTube videos. You're watching all these guys, you know, Aaron Frank, you probably know a ton, ton of pit masters. Do you have oh, yeah. anybody that you really looked up to whose style of, bar whose style of barbecue, you know, really speaks to you? Or are there any guys that you really look up to? Well, Malcolm Reed, shout out to Malcolm Reed. If you actually, his, his channel is called how to barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. If you actually want to learn how to barbecue, right? That man down to a T taught me everything, but um, I kind of mixed it up. So I would watch his videos and I'd watch like a bunch of other people's videos and just through like trial and error, I would be like, all right, this is how I want to make this, you know? And then I would think of different ideas of what to use. Like, you know, a lot of people will use, I don't want to put my secrets out there. I almost just, uh, that's okay. <laughs> I know um, you, I know you have a, like on your site, I read through your website, you have a different style, right? I mean, you have this fusion of barbecue and Mexican. Is that? Oh yeah. Yeah. So the biggest thing, like for the barbecue itself, the barbecue is pretty standard. I like to call it New York barbecue because everything from New York is always better. We took, we took a mix from everything all over the place and we kind of made this baby, you know, like, like for instance, brisket, salt and pepper rub. That's what 90% of America is going to do with it. So for me, my pork rub is one of the greatest things I've ever created with this company. So I mix that in with the salt and pepper. I have a certain ratio that I do with it, which adds a little bit more color and more bite to the brisket and gives it actually a little bit more spice, you know? So that's kind of what we did. We took a bunch of different just ingredients and styles and kind of all pushed it together to make something a little bit more unique, you know? And our, our biggest thing, at least at the restaurant right now, I got to tell you, man, is the sauces that we make because everything is all made in house. And like, I don't know, how we hit this like we hit this gold with it where every sauce we make people are literally like yo i would buy a gallon of this if i could so are it. you bottling and selling not yet we just we didn't expect we didn't expect it to be as good as it was like i had my buddy come in the other day and he's like yeah i want seven of the lime cremas i'm like you want seven he's like oh yeah i want seven big containers of it yeah I'm like, wow all right let's do it <laughs> wow. Well, this is where I was, before we got on this interview, I was mentioning the Long Island Food Council. Mm -hmm. That's where you should be to find out how to bottle your sauce, get your sauce to market. I mean, you already have one distri point, distribution point, your own business, but if you want to mm -hmm. go retail, want to go wholesale or start doing other stuff, yeah, the food councils can really help you with uh, getting that business off the ground if you're really looking to bottle and to do that mm -hmm. stuff. Oh, dude, 100%. Seriously, you got to come in and try that. Once all this is over, I would love for you to come in and just be like, all right, let me test all this stuff out. You know? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I'm a huge foodie. I mean, that's the you know, my main goal for doing this, like the show, is like I get to meet all you guys and talk to the chefs and talk to you guys about what you're doing. Because I'm at home. I experiment in my kitchen. I made ribs yesterday. I play with rubs. I do all the stuff. I cook inside, outside. You know, I'm a foodie. I love it. And I love to eat out, too. So, And, and I love the way you describe the fusion of what you did, taking other people's styles, mashing them up. I, I'm also a musician. So... I, I food is very much like music. It's very improvisational. You got to be able to go with the flow and, you know, feel out creativity and, and how that meal is going to take form, take shape, you know? Listen, man, when it comes down to it, it's just, it's the love of it. You know, same thing with music. It's if you don't have that passion behind it, if you don't have it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be like skill. Cause I've never had any culinary training and half the, 
amazing chefs I know never have, but it, it's the love that comes with it. And you can always tell in the food. You can always tell if someone slops something together really quickly. You know what I mean? You can always tell if someone fu- really gave a crap, you know, like you can't fake it. That's the most beautiful thing about all this, you know, is that it's real. And there's unfortunately in this day and age, man, there's not many things that are really passionately honest left and food is one of them and i don't think it's going to go away anytime soon although when i saw that mcdonald's mechanical robot it got me a little bit nervous but you know (laughs) (laughs) yes i know exactly what you mean i mean it's just it's it's unprecedented times i mean you got half the world now at this point you know since i started doing these two months ago everybody was so concerned shelter in place shelter in place now it's like we got to get the world back open again and now we're a country divided once again about opening up not opening up so uh, I don't even want to go down that road, but it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a crazy time we're in. And, um, you know, I appreciate you guys. I was actually in the process of also opening up a food takeout delivery, like a go, what they call a ghost kitchen right before all Get this. Out of here. Uh, no I was, yeah. And so we put the brakes on it. Now I'm kind of like, you know, should I, shouldn't I? And you, you, I'm a marketing consultant. So, you know, I have my other business to think about. I got, mm-hmm. you know, family and all those things. So, so talk to me about being a marketing consultant, taking the leap. You know, I mean, to me, it sounds like it was just a no-brainer for you. Is that the case, like just transitioning into this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, like I said, I always loved food, and it was just me learning the techniques of barbecue to actually be able to implement it. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, my biggest thing was I I didn't want to go crazy and invest time if this thing didn't actually have legs. So right off the bat, like the the, the greatest story I always tell is that both of my partners were originally construction workers. So that's what they were doing. They were construction mm-hmm. workers. And when they came with this, you know, I'm like, you know, like I said, I'll build a website. I'll do this, this, this. They're like, I got to tell you, man, it's a word of mouth business. It's not really going to work that way. I'm like, well, you're wrong. So I'm going to do it anyway. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so fast forward three years from there, 87% of our inquiries were coming from the website. There you go, man. Power of the web. Exactly. I, mean, I, I mean, I know it all too well. I, you know, I do this stuff. I do videography and content marketing, all that stuff to help yeah, yeah. You know, local businesses. So, you know, that's, that's it, in today's world. And that's where you, unfortunately, you know, we see some of the older restaurants that are struggling mm-hmm. right now because they haven't figured out how to capture the attention of, you know, the audience they need to. And, and they relied on their old systems, just people driving by or walking in and, and you can't yeah. do that right now. People need to be able to get you digitally, you know, whether it's through the delivery services, whether you want mm-hmm. your own delivery and takeout, ordering on your website, um, you know, you got to be set up for these things. So yeah, uh, that's it. I see a lot of the new businesses that are taking a leap forward during this time. Um, and then there's really great establishments like Bravo Nader. I mean, they, they closed up shop this weekend. So it's crazy. Yeah, that was the place in, what am I thinking? Huntington? Northport. Where were North, they? Huntington, Northport. Northport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I read that story online. I actually broke my heart. This poor guy, like, gave it his heart and his soul. It's and, crazy. Like, just, he's like, no one wants to take out a $60 plate of lobster. I'm like, Jesus, this poor guy. I know. And he, well, it's hard because he can't, he doesn't want to pivot, you know, and then change what he's doing. And it, so yeah. it's really, really tough, really tough. See, with what we did, like, where our, our spot is takeout. We have a very, very tiny place, like a very tiny place. And the nice thing about our setup is that, the whole ass of our building is kitchen. It's a 16 seat like place. So we, we have like, we don't have that many people that are, we're expecting to sit down. It's more of a takeout place than anything else. So with us, we, we didn't have an issue opening for that reason. If we had a 20 table or 40 table place, mm-hmm. I'd be shitting bricks right now. I'd be very scared. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. It's a whole different animal, man. You know, so you. for those guys that have that, that's what breaks my heart is those people that have that type of establishment that can't kind of adapt to this. And, and I don't know, it just, it makes me sad to see that. Uh, absolutely. Same here. Well, let's talk a little bit about, more about your menu. What's you talked about the sauces. That's a big hit for you guys. What mm-hmm. else is hot on the menu? I mean, we know brisket's the standard, other things. What's, what's, what are people going for on the menu these days? Surprisingly enough, um, the pulled pork sandwich is like the biggest thing that we sell. And I love my pulled pork, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I kind of, like, if I were to look at that menu, I'd get the ribs, you know, the brisket. I'd get, you know, the pulled pork sandwich, though, just for some reason stepped up just because, so it's a pulled, it's obviously pulled pork and a a toasted brioche bun, um, and then it's got an onion ring on it, and then the coleslaw on it as well. 
And for some reason, it just melds together. And it's actually funny. So we created, created it kind of by accident. Like we were just like, we were messing around with some stuff and we're like, all right, let's just throw coleslaw on top. Who gives a crap? What, what's the worst that happens? It sucks. <laughs> so we tried, we tried it. We were like, oh my God, what the hell did we just make? I'm like, mm -hmm. we actually made this. I'm like, this tastes ridiculous. Like, and ever since then, like ever since we opened for some reason, it's just skyrocketed up, you know, and just the quesadillas and the burgers, like, so the ultimate barbecue burger, I got to give a shout out to as well. This was all my partner Pat's doing. He made this thing from scratch. It's a six ounce burger with cheddar cheese, brisket, pulled pork, and an onion ring and bacon. This thing will put you to sleep. It's on a toasted brioche bun as well. This thing will put you to sleep in two seconds, man. But it takes you on a freaking journey eating this damn thing. It is beautiful, man. It's so good. And it's got actually a mix of our hickory barbecue sauce and our Carolina barbecue sauce. Damn, that is serious. That is a serious burger. I can tell just by hearing about it. Oh, that yeah. is that is serious news right there. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't know if my little body can handle even consuming half that. <laughs> I I might go it's into rough. A, it's a, it's a piece of a burger, man. I yeah. might go into a food. I'm, I have a ten year old uh, stepson. Mm. He probably that would he would eyeball that on the menu and he'd want and he'd put down about half of it and sleep on the ride home oh yeah <laughs> he, loves, he loves to his eyes are bigger than his stomach he loves to eat like that he sees the biggest thing on the menu he's got to have it you know one of those guys that's awesome but he's only 10 you know so and more power to him damn <laughs> exactly so i was checking out your menu i always like to try to find some unique items things like that i mm -hmm. saw the meat tornado okay what, what is this okay so the meat tornado right off the bat, um, if anyone's a Parks and Rec fan, that's where the name came from. There was a, <laughs> it was just on an episode with Ron Swanson and Andy Dwyer, and that's where I got the name for it. But basically, we wanted to create something that was just absurdly packed with protein that we thought would catch like people's eyes, just like, all right, like I'm looking to be sloppy today. Let me go for this thing. So we we were trying to think of like the best proteins to put in it. But, you know, we wanted to kind of stray away from the brisket a little bit just because, A, it's super, super expensive, which means we would have to jump up the price on it. And B, it's, you know, we had it in enough places where it, it would kind of work. So we tried out like chicken, steak, pulled pork, and then we actually tried rib tips with it where we actually, it was just a nightmare cutting out the cartilage, but it was mm. still not worth it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But we ended up, we ended up getting down to the actual meats that we like for it. Um, and then sauces came we're like all right why don't we try this why don't we try this um so basically when we got down to it it just ended up being grilled chicken steak pulled pork it had the cheese that we toasted on the grill with it with the tortilla and then lime crema and the carolina barbecue sauce and it was just that's it it's every single recipe that we ended up coming up with it was just the look me and my partner gave each other like yep that's it right here let's say call it right now if we keep messing with it it's not going to end up as good <laughs> yeah you got to stop somewhere right it's like you gotta you gotta finish the project as a, as a filmmaker you know i know that all too well it's like you could go on and on and on continue continue to tweak and go and go and then it'll never be out it'll just never be really so yeah, and, uh, and you got to stop it that's the biggest thing is like you can't be your worst en your own worst enemy with it you got to be like all right nah this is good let's do this but exactly one of the other interesting things I found, you guys offer a number of vegan options. So I think you have a vegan pulled pork. How do you guys pull that off? I, again, learned this from YouTube. I found a couple of videos that I liked, mm -hmm. and then I kind of messed with it myself until I found a creation that I dug. So it's made from king oyster mushrooms, where they are smoked on the barbecue, or I'm sorry, smoked in the smoker with apple and hickory wood. So take it off. We caramelize it with some barbecue sauce. Um, some dark corn syrup. I would love to put honey in it, but then I got to change it to vegetarian, so I lose my uh, stick. Um, uh. <laughs> but um, and then we put our dry rub on it, and believe it or not, after you shred it up, it actually it, it's vegetable, so it does not taste exactly like pulled pork. It sure as hell looks exactly like it, but it, it does have a little bit more of a vegetable flavor. But it is pretty solid. So my sister is slowly becoming a vegan you know, this, despite my conversations with, with her trying to push her the other way, she, so she came in one day and she is the most, I, I love my sister, but like brutally honest with that, that type of person with that, like actually meaning it should be like, oh, this sucks. Like, 
okay, you know. <laughs> you need those so people she around. She came in and she tried this and like it was beautiful. She texted me, she goes, I was nervous with you opening up this restaurant because I know you mean well. I know your food is pretty good, but like this was on freaking real, Chris. Like, I am so freaking proud of you. I'm like, if she told me this, then my vegan pulled pork is on on point. So once we got that recipe down, we're working on a couple right now. The next one that I'm really excited for, which I hope to, uh, we're, we're trying to do a grand opening June 6th. So I'm trying to have it done by then, um, is a vegan pork belly bite. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, it's what are we using? Jackfruit. Jackfruit figured. Okay. And it is surprise. It actually tastes exactly like pork belly. It's wild. So we're trying to get to the point where do we add some, you know, do we add some barbecue sauce to it? Do we keep it with just the dry rub on it? You know, we're trying to really tinker with it and get it to the point where it's just, you know, we're, we're happy with it. But when that launches, that thing is like a vegan junk food heaven. That's like, awesome. I would even eat a, a full bag of those things without even thinking twice about it. It's delicious. <laughs> that's so cool man yeah i love i love your creativity i love how you guys are putting these things together and you're catering to you know all all audiences i mean a lot of people in the barbecue biz right they're just straight up meat eaters they wouldn't even think twice about putting a vegan option on their menu yeah, right yeah. right the real purists i mean so it's cool and and i think you know in this day and age you know having those options for people because even you got you got i'll call them split families right you got the husband is a, is a meat eater and the wife is a vegan he wants barbecue can't take her out because he can't get barbecue anymore you know so you got you got a lot of people struggling out Funny, there. i had a guy in <laughs> yesterday with that exact same scenario see it happens it happens all over the place right i call them mixed families right yeah. we got mixed families Listen, man, the way the way that they care, the way that i think about it me and my partner are eye to eye on this as well like if you can be vegan, more freaking power to you. Animals are brutal for the environment. They really are. The way that they have to farm everything nowadays, if you can be one of those people that don't consume any animal products and allow me to eat that, you are stronger than I am. And I give you all the credit in the world. And you, no matter what, if I'm ever serving food to you, you will be able to eat something that I have. I will always make sure that everyone's fed. That was our number one thing. It was almost our slogan, actually. For the wow. catering company is you will never go hungry no matter who you are a terrible and, slogan right but yeah uh, yeah you never <laughs> i think another brand might have that or something but too <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. um so i'm curious about the philanthropic portion of the restaurant so up at the top of the interview we kind of talked about it you were donating everything to hospital and frontline workers and things like mm. that but you also offer discounts to military police and fire department on your catering order. So talk to me a little bit about the philanthropic side of the business and, you know, how that's evolved and what your plans are for the future. Okay. Well, like right off the bat. So our, our main goal at the end of all of this is we want to do a charity. It's so originally what we talked about. That is going to be our end game, bigger bellies for America. Like we want to make a full thing out of it, see how many people we can feed, how many people we can help. Obviously, we need to make sure that we're taken care of first and we can grow the business to be able to have that reach, to be able to do it on an effective level. Um, but we we sat down, like for at least the hospital donations, we sat down and we were just like, all right, like this is, uh, despite us not wanting to believe this is real because we invested our entire fortune into this right now, this is bad, you know? And like, I had my cousin working at Queens Hospital. I had, oh no, I'm sorry, New York Presbyterian. You know, I have tons of friends that were at St. Catharines and Smithtown. I had friends all over the place that were like, listen, like, this is scary. This is bad. And we're working 12 hours. We can't stop. We can't, we don't have the option to not do this. Like, people need us right now. My cousin's pregnant, like six months pregnant, going in there every day like a boss. Like, she is the strongest chick in the world. And literally just like nonstop. She's like, I don't care if it kills me. I'm going in. Like, she just, so these people really, it didn't matter how it affected them. And we just, we were like, what the hell are we doing, man? Like, we gotta, we gotta actually do something. Let's see if we can even get some money because if we even had a little, like we donated a little bit ourselves, but to be honest with you, we just didn't have the funds to do it. So we're like, all right, if we even get a thousand dollars, let's think about this, man. We do rice, beans, you know, and we'll find a way to get like cheaper proteins out there and we can feed a decent amount of people, you know? So we put this fundraiser up and 
like I said, we expected maybe a thousand dollars. I think I put two thousand dollars for the fundraising thing. Fast forward four or five days, I think we were up to three thousand dollars, and it was insane. And it was at the point where I my stomach was churning because I couldn't even get hospitals on the phone because this is when this was just brutal and everyone's trying to donate everyone's trying to help and i'm like i just collected three thousand dollars from these people and i can't find anywhere to feed them like <laughs> wow and then i had all these people that like friends of mine that just reached out like hey listen i'm gonna call up hospitals and set this up the right way help you out with this because i know you're swamped i know you're you know i know you're doing it but you know if you need places to go let's find you places so a shout out to my friend taylor sarsfield went above and beyond got us queen's hospital um and I th think she got us one other hospital. We donated to a bunch of places and it's terrible because I can't even remember how many we went to at this point. But she she set that up. She talked to all the people, helped us out with it. We got Stony Brook. Um, my brother-in-law's mother was one of the head nurses at a nursing home. We donated to them as well. Um, and we, at this point, like I said, I think a couple thousand meals at this point we've managed to feed because we have... Um, Queens Hospital right now basically is taking any donors. They loved our food so much that um, David over there, who's, I actually don't know David's official position, but I think he's like um, just somewhere in the administration. And he was like, we love your food so much. Anyone that's willing to donate to us, we're sending them right to you, you know? So because we were doing meals for extremely cheap, we were doing full barbecue meals for $6 a plate, which Wow. You know, you yeah. know food enough that you can't we're get not you making can't. money on it remotely. You know, it was covering food expenses, but it was perfect because we could still help all these people out, you know, and it gave us a chance to get in the kitchen and just, it, I don't know, man, it just, it was a good thing that we could do. It made us feel good and it helped out a lot of people, you know, and then with our military and firefighter discount, we just kept the mind state of if I'm running away from bullets and someone's running toward them, you damn well deserve five percent off your bill. God damn it, dude! You know, if yeah. I'm running out of a fire and you're running in, you deserve at least five percent off your bill. <laughs> you know, so we we've had that for years, and we continue. We're always going to have discounts like that too. Awesome, awesome, man. Well, it's been a pleasure hearing your journey, which technically has only just begun. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I I wish you nothing but continued success for Big Belly Barbecue and you and your partners. Um, is there anything else you want to share before we uh, kind of wrap things up? The only thing is, so should be June 6th, praying on everything opening up, praying that people aren't getting sick anymore, or at least the numbers decreasing, um, we're going to have a grand opening. There are certain menu items right now that we had an original menu that we took off and we're tinkering with. We will have everything back on by June 6th. Um, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and hope you guys try our food. I hope you like it. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I know I'll be one of the first in line to check it out. I can't wait to uh, get a taste and see what you guys are all about. I'm jazzed about the meat tornado and all the other <laughs> awesome items. I I'm a rib guy, so I definitely want to try your ribs. And, uh, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, you got it. They're good, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, Chris, thanks so much for joining the Big Food Talk today, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. My pleasure. Thanks, Al. Ciao. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Big Food Talk, produced by Tough Monkey Entertainment. Subscribe on iTunes and wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram for behind-the-scenes takes or watch complete episodes on YouTube. Don't forget to make a donation at BigFoodTalk.com.